just ran out. Of course it would be mine. How old is he? He's nine there. Wow. <laughs> and, uh, my awesome. daughter. That's awesome. Do you want to put somebody in front of me? Oh, oh, oh. Okay. I mean, I met with him before I met with yeah. you, and he said, we got it, we'll take it in the back, and said, sorry about that. <clears throat> Okay, we're going to go ahead and get started again. Um, welcome everyone back. Uh, we have Dr. Or sorry, Carolyn T Toomey coming to speak with us. She's a former OR nurse and now the VP of Clinical uh, Research. Uh, and uh, she's going to speak with us about ties, white coats, and caps. Where is the evidence? Scrubs in and out of the OR, change versus cover. I know we all want to keep wearing our scrub hats, so we hope you're going to give us the good news. My good news would be if my slides would play in the back. So it's a, a dark gray slide with dark pink bubbles on it. That's the first slide. Yay. So you know what happens to me. I have a daughter who's um, applying to medical school, and she goes, Mom, there's this great new thing called Prezi. You need to do your presentation in Prezi. So trying to be technologically advanced, I'm using it, and we're having some hiccups. That's all I can say. So thank you very much for having me. Uh, thanks Lynn and Phil and the people who asked me to speak and be a part of this. This was really, I was really excited about it and then I saw the title and I thought, caps, surgical caps. I'm not sure if I should take my flak jacket and bring it with me, but okay, I'll speak to that. So if you'll go on the journey with me, I'm also gonna ask you to be engaged with me. I don't know if you've ever watched Parliament Vote. It's a lot of fun. For very conservative Brits, it's very noisy. So when we get to the right slides, and because you are the experts, more than I'm the expert, after I show you the data that's there, you're going to have to vote. And if you vote yes to the statement, you're going to yell, hear, hear. And if you don't agree with the statement, you're going to say, rubbish. And I have a prompt slide for you. So. I hope you'll play along with me. Next slide. So first and most popular topic probably in here, ties, white coats, and caps. Let's take a look at what the evidence shows. Next slide. So when we talk about ties, and yes, I do think that that's a handsome tie, this is the only study in all of the literature that I found that actually looked at demonstrating actual transmission. Simulated scenario, they did the, they used mannequins, did a 2.5 minute HMP, they had put 
Micrococcus luteus on the terminal ends of the tie, the front of the shirt, and uh, around the cuffs of the sleeves, and you can look at the results. There was no difference in the presence of Micrococcus based on the culture sites on the mannequin, no difference in colony counts or numbers of contaminated mannequins, but it was very clear if there was an encounter with an unsecured tie that there were significantly more mannequins uh, contaminated with a significant p-value of 0 0.036. Next slide. Next slide. Um, in this uh, particular article, it was a systematic review. It's important to note that it is not a meta-analysis. It's a very heterogeneous population. It's a very small study size pool and very poor quality of criteria between the studies. Of the 44 articles that remained in, the, in this uh, pool of articles being considered, and you, so you can see even the population of evidence here is very small. Only six met the inclusion criteria. There was one level A, 1A study uh, that compared bow ties versus neckties, and there was no difference in contamination rates. Go figure, bow ties and, and uh, neckties. Four gave level 3B evidence, and, four, and one gave level 4 evidence. It's basically um, throughout all of the literature that the evidence that ties get contaminated is true but there is a paucity of evidence to show that there's any transfer or cross-contamination from those ties. Next slide. Okay, that's the evidence on ties that exist out there today. So now you get to vote. Does wearing a necktie increase the risk of cross-contamination? How many for here, here? Here, here. How many for rubbish? Oh my, okay, good, <laughs> this is fun. And, and by the way, when we get into caps, you can fist bump, you can jump up and down, it really will be okay. Next slide. <clears throat> White coats. So I, I thought I'd start with the Shea document because the Shea document uh, actually acknowledges that there are no studies that directly link workers' um, uh, apparel to HAIs and there's an absence of strong evidence. So we'll start there. I don't know how many of you know Gonzalo Behrman. I actually considered putting his picture up there instead of Dr. McDreamy, but um, I, just, I just had to go with that when I saw that picture online. And they actually have come out with a recommendation to, for you to consider until such time as there is evidence. Bare below the elbows like they have in, in Europe, a practice of laundering white coats daily or hanging them up prior to going in and seeing your patient, cleaning of stethoscopes and badges or lanyards. And by the way, although it's not a topic for this, there are quite a few articles about badges and lanyards, more than there are about ties. Um, and then a daily laundering of any clothing that has the potential to touch a patient. Next slide. get more time with McDreamy here. Yeah, you do. Here, here. Oh, it's missed two slides in between. Yes. So in this particular study, I really like this one because they took 100 undergraduates mm -hmm. and postgraduate medical um, students and interns, and they selected um, they randomly selected the population. You can see the male-female distribution. They took swabs from the four areas on the white coats, and then they looked at those washed at home, and they were more contaminated than those washed in the hospital, and the frequency of how much these coats are washed. And I think this is really important because I think a lot of people keep those white coats on and circulate them for a very long time. And I can remember, even in the OR, we'd have white coats hanging on pegs and there would be 40 of them and the first 10 always got picked up and put on and people would go out the door so you didn't really know what was going on. It did show contamination more at the sides of the jacket than anywhere else and you think about putting your hands down in your pockets and for uh, interns and residents all the junk they've got in those pockets you know as they're pulling that out all day long. There was a staph, heavy staph aureus contamination and also coagulative staph and pseudomonas. The recommendations that came out of this study are annual new coat, throw the old one away, um, a required washing of weekly, 
and scrupulous hand hygiene. This is the only study, and there are going to be a lot of them in this little grouping, where they even mentioned hand hygiene, because if you look at what your normal uh, flora is on your skin, that uh, could be the fault of a lot of this. Next slide. These were, uh, this was another study, and I apologize, it's a little bit of an eye chart, but they looked at bacterial contamination. This is a European study of using a white coat or having a short sleeve uniform uh, top that surgeons or physicians wore every day. And so this was a prospective randomized control study that found no statistical differences in bacterial or MRSA contamination of white coats compared to the short sleeve uniforms. But importantly, they cultured them before they put them on in the morning, essentially a zero um, contamination rate. But after three hours of wear, it was 50% of what it was at eight hours. So very quickly, those coats get contaminated and um, are contaminated through the eight hour process. After eight hours of wear, there was no difference between uh, uniforms or laundered white coats. And it doesn't support, according to this study, the white coats versus short sleeve uniforms for physicians. Next slide. Okay, time to vote because this is the best of the literature out there on white coats. Does a white coat, wearing a white coat, increase the risk for cross contamination? Those for here, here? Here, here. Those for rubbish? rubbish. Interesting. Okay, next slide. Aha, uh -huh. here's what I pictured <laughs> when this topic came up. Don't, don't, don't go there yet. <laughs> don't go there yet. Okay, um, hit it so that the video plays. This is what I saw in my mind, and that's Phil Berry's eyeball there, right there in the center. <laughs> Just saying. But I figured that this was a fireworks kind of topic for everybody. So I was really thrilled about this part, but interesting for me, and I enjoyed the walk through the literature. Next slide. Oh, you get to watch it again. There you go. Okay, here's where the fireball began, right? This was the fireball in 2014 with a significant change from AORN and their recommendations on surgical attire, and it resulted in abrupt practice changes across the study, across the um, country. The other thing that's interesting, and, and you'll hear this over and over again in this, is it has driven scientific study on the issues about surgical attire for the first time in a very, very long time. <laughs> There's really current, like from 2015 on research, and the rest of it is way back in the wilderness or from another country. So it's interesting the effect that it's had. Next slide. And by the way, they came out with this uh, full and complete literature review two years later, basically to say the literature does support it and we're standing by it. So I, I, good that they looked at the literature. They made a decision to stand by these covering of the um, ears and all of the hair. Next slide. So there are a number of organizations who now also recommend full head coverings, CMS has a requirement, the World Health Organization, the Association of Surgical Techs, and the CDC guideline in 2017 now also incorporate that recommendation from, from AORN's recommended practices. Next slide. So I love, this, I love this article, and what I love about this article, not just the art and the science, because I believe there's an art and a science, but that they use their NISQIP data to take a look at uh, general and vascular patients. And so they had 1,900 patients undergoing um, 1950 procedures, and 39% uh, before the practice change and 60% after the practice change. You can see the procedures there. The SSI rate be before the practice change was 5.3, and after the practice change was 5.5, obviously. no. Uh, great p-value there. Multivariate analysis, so no association between practice change and SSI occurrence. Next slide. I also love this one. This is two hospitals 
um, Tampa General and the University of Rochester, but re what's really compelling about this, it happened after a Department of Health site visit. So the Department of Health now audits to those recommended practices. And they looked at um, the nine minutes of retrospective NISQIP data and nine months of post-implementation data, and they looked at patient clinical and operative issues associated with it. And despite a shift to more clean cases in that period of post-implementation time, there were no difference in length of stay, complications, or mortality. Surgical attire in this case did not uh, reduce SSI rates, and it would have taken a sample size of over 485,000 patients to give you a good statistical 10% reduction. Important to know that the leadership and the uh, operating areas of these two hospitals said, we're going back to the pre-2014 era. Next slide. Um, and, and then this stat study, and I'd like to spend a little time on it. You may have seen this in JAX, but I have spent a lot of time with one of the authors of this study. They actually did environmental quality indicators using cloth caps, paper skull caps, and the paper bouffant caps, or the disposables. They, what they saw was that there was no significant differences between disposable bouffant, bouffant and disposable skull cap with regard to particle size and microbial contamination. When they looked at skull caps, disposable hat, bouffant hats had a higher microbial shed at the sterile field using settle plates. Pretty significant. When compared to uh, cloth skull caps, disposable bouffants yielded a higher micron particulate fallout in the field from the material itself. And that disposable bouffants have a larger average and my, uh, maximum pore sizes compared with skull caps for shedding of um, squams from the, from the head. And then they were significantly more permeable than either other option. Next slide. This one was important enough to have two slides. So in conclusion, you can see that bouffants compared to skull caps have higher permeability, penetration, and microbial shed. And compared to cloth skull caps, the same. Clearly, in this study, disposable bouffant hats should not be considered a superior, superior to skull caps in preventing airborne contamination in the OR. Next slide. And finally, in the Jacobs School of Medicine, the State University of New York, they looked at, after banning the skull cap, 16,000 clean cases, they used class one cases only, from 2014 to 2016, and using bouffants did not uh, lower SSI rates. And they also put in the literature, which is something to think about, if you're trying to remove your loops or headlamp or whatever other head-mounted device there are, they do documented innumerable, innumerable removal of the bouffant cap trying to get the other device off of their head so that the, the, expo the exposure occurred at the surgical table. So they recommended that ACS and AORN work more closely together in trying to develop these. Next slide. I know that you know the AS surgical attire recommendations. I am put it, I put it in here because I think we need to do that. Um, the skull cap is symbolic of the surgical profession, and I want to say to you that the other important thing to think of is for your female colleagues, surgeons, who are wearing a hat and distinguishing themselves as the surgeon in the room, to not wearing a skull cap for them makes them look like a nurse at the table. And that, that is a challenge, I think, for, for our female surgeon colleagues. Um, but it's a, it is symbolic of our profession. It's been around a very long time. It can be worn, cover as much hair as you can with the cape, with it, with it but uh, the nape of the neck and modest sideburns aren't an issue. Next slide. Okay, how do you vote? Does wearing a bouffant reduce the risk of SSI? Here, here. Dead silence. Rubbish! Rubbish. Ugh. Good. All right. Next slide. Very satisfied man there in his skull cap. Just couldn't help it. <laughs> Next slide. 
So now what? We take a look at scrubs. Scrubs in and out of the OR. <laughs> okay, next slide. So one of the things I wanted to address was does home laundering make a difference with scrubs as we talk about scrubs in and out of the OR and what's going on with them. In this particular study that was done by an environmental uh, researcher, they found no difference in bacterial counts between hospital laundered scrubs, new cloth scrubs, and new disposable scrubs. However, home laundered scrubs were dirtier coming into the hospital in the morning compared to the scrubs worn for the length of an eight hour uh, shift. Next slide. The impact of home versus hospital dressing. So they actually did, the, the first is home, home laundering and dressed at home, home laundering and dressed at the hospital, they took their scrubs in, versus hospital um, laundering. And they, uh, 21 residents for uh, daily, randomized for four days in, an op, in a randomized pattern. There were no differences between home and hospital dress cohorts. No difference in the cohorts demonstrating bacterial growth after 72 hours. And no difference in total bacterial bio burden at the beginning of the shift at home. Next slide. There is an OSHA trump card and that says that all PPS, the employer has to clean, launder, and dispose of personal protective equipment um, as required by the standard. And it has to be removed prior to leave, leaving the work area. Flying out here, I sat by a guy in scrubs next to me on the plane. Of course, he was a metals implant kind of guy, so, but he's been in the OR all day in those scrubs and sitting next to me. Had to wonder about that. Next slide. So do home laundered scrubs have a higher bio burden than hospital laundered scrubs? Here, here? Here, here. Rubbish? Okay, rubbish. Next slide. Uh, in this particular study, they, it, it's called the ASCOT study. They looked at total contamination on scrubs as the colonies, um, total sum colony forming units. They had 40 subjects, three 12 hour shifts, 2,900 plus um, environmental cultures, 2,100 plus clothing cultures and scrub type was not associated with any kind of change in scrub contamination. These compared, so this is where industry goes awry. They, they think that they've got to fix the scrub problem. These were two different antimicrobial impregnated scrubs. They were not effective at reducing uh, healthcare practitioner contamination, and it did demonstrate, however, that the environment, as we just heard in the last, from the last speaker, is an important source of contamination. Next slide. A randomized crossover trial looking at another and different antimicrobial scrub, essentially the same result. No difference in the rate of contamination between, between a normal pair of scrubs and a treated pair of scrubs. Next slide. Comparison of two single-use scrubs, because now there are single-use disposable scrubs that people can wear. They wanted to look at colony forming units and there was no difference from standard scrubs. Next slide. How do you vote? Antimicrobial impregnated scrubs reduce the potential for contamination. Here, here. Rubbish. Okay, next slide. And uh, I particularly like this study. They did, uh, we always wonder about wearing a cover gown. You can see it's a British article. They call it a covering gown. Um, 75 clinicians had pieces of fabric from, fabric from clean scrubs attached to two areas on their scrubs. And there were cohorts, those that wore a cover gown when they left the sterile area, ones, uh, those that did not wear a cover gown outside the sterile area, and those that actually went outside the hospital facility without a cover gown, gown. And what's interesting was wearing cover gowns over scrub suits didn't reduce the rates of contamination regardless of where those practitioners went. Next slide. In this particular, sli in, in this particular study, they looked in, again, a randomized crossover study. They, these are anesthetists that uh, did this study. They had sample pieces attached again to different places on their scrubs and they were pulled every 150 minutes. Um, mean bacterial counts increased significantly over the course of a working day. That was statistically significant. 
contamination was lower in the chest compared to the hip, and you think about all the things you bump up against in the stretchers and tables and countertops, it's pretty logical. And then the mean bacterial counts um, at the end of the day, restricted to the theater was 25.2, theater and to surgical wards, lower, and theater and departmental office, so also lower. Uh, while it's not statistically significant, scrubs worn to those areas did not significantly increase contamination. Next slide. And finally, because AORN also recommended uh, the, wa the wearing of a warm-up jacket, there was no demonstrated reduction in SSI from the policy change of requiring the wearing of a warm-up jacket. Next slide. And to Patch Dellinger, what could I say? Don, I think there's got to be a one-liner here, but I can't figure it out. I know that I would leave that to you. But there is sanity in these two paragraphs, and I'm gonna give you a moment to read them because I think it's important. If you've not read this, and if I hear you giggle, I know you've gotten to the, shall we remain naked beneath our surgical gowns? I'm not going to spoil the fun. You need to read the article, but it's an intriguing question. But I also like the answer, employee satisfaction, oh boy. But that balanced approach to operating room attire and the decisions that we make about it are so important. Next slide. So do cover gowns or jackets worn over scrubs outside the sterile area reduce the potential for contamination? Here, here. Rubbish. Rubbish. Yes. Okay, next slide. So what would an industry person do? I'd, I'd, I'd really do a SWOT analysis. Next slide. Next slide. Next slide. So if we take the look at the, the strengths of what's going on out there, for me, the strength is that the AORN recommended practices really stimulated renewed debate and interest in real evidence regarding surgical attire. And the recent research is so much ro more robust than what was done in the early work. So that's a positive. Next slide. The weaknesses, many recommendations are being made based on logic rather than evidence. In general, there's been a lack of interest in research regarding surgical attire. You ask me, I go, surgical attire? Not very sexy when I think biofilm, pyrogens. So I understand that. But the, the other issue out here is there, there really aren't many financial resources for looking at uh, surgical attire. Next slide. The opportunities, organizations like ours, um, ACS, MSIS, organizations who are really interested in infection issues and research have an opportunity to drive, to drive collaborative opportunities to do research and, and to rewrite these um, sacred cows, if you will, that we believe in out there. And partnering with industry, especially those companies who manufacture PPE, is always a good way to get research funding to take a look at those issues. I see this as a great resident project. I mean, it would be something that uh, an intern or a resident really ought to take on and, and make definitive um, research possible. Next slide. Finally, and the, I, the threat that I see is until research-minded organizations support very fundamental studies, practice recommendations are going to continue to include assumptions and logic instead of pure evidence. And evidence-driven new product development, like scrubs with antimicrobials in it, I mean, there's now three on the market, and they don't make a difference. Those things will continue to happen. So your needs need to be met in a very effective way, and industry new product development needs science and evidence to base that work on. Thank you. That's it for me. I appreciate it. Here, here. Here, here. All right, that was awesome.
so I can go throw away those paper things I have to wear out of the OR to the cafeteria <laughs> and go through about three of them a day. Uh, how much would that save an uh, institution, do you think? I don't know, but we could do a cost analysis. be simple to do. Yeah. <laughs> More to follow. I already texted that as a project to one of my <laughs> colleagues in the audience. <laughs> um, <laughs> Sorry, guys. Uh, next talk. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, isolation practices, best practices, do they work inpatient versus outpatient practice? Uh, so our next two are kind of patients, are, you know, these three are debates, but they're debating each other. So uh, um, I mean, in other words, you're debating yourself. So between you, uh, PJ, I think you could make a good argument. I'm looking forward to this discussion. Dr. Uh, PJ O'Neill did his training uh, at uh, University of Virginia, another Rob Sawyer uh, protege, and uh, we look forward and then went to Vanderbilt for his fellowship and has been in Arizona for quite some time now. Uh, Dr. Patrick O'Neill, look forward to your talk. Actually, Jeff uh, <clears throat> talked me through my first chest tube as a, when I was an intern, so. Uh, I want to thank the society for the opportunity to uh, talk. When Jeff called me, it was a couple months ago, either you were on vacation or I was on vacation. I think probably one of us was drinking. <laughs> and uh, he asked me to give this talk, and I was like scratching my head. I'm like, I'm not really a, it's not really my thing, but yeah, sure, I'll help out a friend. But when I saw the title, uh, it kind of bothered me that the inpatient versus outpatient, because none of us really have a thriving outpatient practice. So I did take a little bit of artistic license, uh, and I, I changed it to do the best practices work, and if not, why? So I do have some disclosures. First, I am not a subject matter on this, ex or not a subject matter expert on this, and I look forward to a spirited discussion by those in the audience who are. I do apologize in advance. I mean, this is a pretty broad topic. Um, so this is an incredibly superficial look at, at this. But I have been told I do look fabulous with my face covered by a mask, and the yellow gowns make my brown eyes pop. <laughs> so I, <laughs> so uh, just briefly, uh, isolation top uh, types, uh, contact, uh, droplet, and the various uh, sundries you must wear. Uh, airborne, and then the mixed air, airborne uh, droplet for the hazmat uh, that we'll discuss a little bit more. Isolation practices themselves uh, are supposedly used to minimize pathogen transmission. And Carolyn, thank you for your talk because I didn't even touch any sort of garb because that clearly could be an, uh, an entire session worth of uh, discussion. By minimizing pathogen transmission, uh, you're, you're thought to decrease hospital-acquired infections. And who are the bad actors? Well, most often it's the uh, microorganisms with antibiotic resistance, the MRSAs, VREs, ESBLs that we deal with pretty much on a daily basis. And they're both in our hospitals, our nursing homes, dialysis units, so forth. And then the organisms with high transmission rates, the C. diffs, the TBs, norovirus, we all hear about a cruise ship every quarter, it seems like, that gets uh, contaminated with norovirus and everybody's uh, uh, isolated to their rooms. And influenza, obviously, this, this year was horrible. I don't know how it was where you live, but in Phoenix it was, uh, I mean, we had, our hospitals, some of them had to pretty much close to uh, ambulance traffic because the uh, influenza was so bad. And then microorganisms with high virulence. These are the scary ones that we hear about on our 24-hour on news cycle. The uh, SARS, the Ebolas, so forth, which take another level of, uh, of uh, protection. So you would think that isolation practices for these bad actors is intuitively good. Well, I've been in Phoenix now so as Jeff said, uh, I went to Phoenix after my training at Vanderbilt, so I've got to present this topic in terms of a southwestern kind of way, right? So the good, do they work? 
Every published guideline says they work. Otherwise, they wouldn't publish it. Probably the most, <laughs> the most influential is the CDC guidelines, most comprehensive and most influential CDC guidelines that if you go to their website, they're continually updating it uh, with, uh, with new data as it comes out. Uh, it's a 203-page document online, covers literally every pathogen known to mankind, and is used as the basis for all of the isolation practices that we do every day. And in some form, your in individual institutions mandate it. it. Probably there's a little bit of variation here and there, but for the most part, we're, we're doing the same thing. The take home of that entire document, isolation practices reduce pathogen transmission and lower patient mortality. So if they truly work, this is kind of an irrelevant talk. We should just be doing it every time, right? But because it's mandated, by our institutions, we kind of have to do it. But our isolation practices themselves the most important factor in preventing pathogen spread? And I would argue it's really not. It's just part of it. Uh, universal precautions, hand hygiene, and antibiotic stewardship need to be the cornerstone of every practice that we have. My two institutions that I've worked at in Phoenix, I actually started the antibiotic stewardship programs because they were not existent when I showed up. Um, with the bad, isolation practices may reduce pathogen transmission, but they may also do some harm. There's a significant monetary cost, and I'll go through each one of these individually. Physical, uh, the supplies you need, the gowns, the gloves, the hats, the masks, the hazmat suits, whatever. Uh, I, I read something where they said the healthcare workers' labor time to gown up and degown, and I said this is nonsense. You know, it takes 20 seconds to put on your garb and take it off. You need to employ infection control practitioners. They frequently stealthily. In fact, was it Joe? Joe said that uh, they'll, they'll be sitting over there and they'll be keeping track of whether you do your hand hygiene or put on your appropriate garb. And they give all that data to the evil hospital infection control empire. So you've got to watch out. Screening, follow-up, repeat testing, decolonization, all these things, uh, all buzzwords in infection control practices. And the cost of cohorting isolated patients versus non-isolated patients, you've got one isolated patient in a two-room, or a two-bed room, and you don't have a second, then you're losing a bed. So there's some costs associated there. Probably the biggest thing is delaying patient uh, disposition getting them to the nursing home, to rehab, uh, you know, operative procedures, so forth. Um, there, there's a cost associated with that. And then there's some non-monetary costs, adverse events we'll talk about, and uh, uh, less healthcare worker contact. But there's some patient costs that are 